I've just referred to the Solicitor's Regulation Authority, SRA, Hogan Lovells, the international law firm headquartered here in London, for enabling a corrupt money launderer to be returned to his post as second in command of the critically important South African Revenue Service, SARS. I've asked S S the SRA to withdraw Hogan Lovell's authorization as a recognized body and to examine what other disciplinary action can be taken against its leading partners, including withdrawing their permission to practice as solicitors. Hogan Lovell spared two of the most notorious perpetrators of state capture in South Africa, Tom Moyani, head of SARS, and his deputy, Jonas Makwakwa, from accountability for their complicity in and cover-up of serious financial crimes. In so doing, Hogan Lovells was complicit in undermining South Africa's once revered tax collecting agency and thereby effectively underpinning President Jacob Zuma and his business associates, the Gupta brothers and others, in perverting South Africa's democracy, damaging its economy and robbing its taxpayers. When Hogan Lovells was engaged by the corrupt Moyani in September 2016, it was well known that he and Makwakwa were synonymous with President Jacob Zuma's capture of the state. Hogan Lovells could therefore not plead ignorance as they walked right into the, that web of corruption and cronyism for a fat fee. To help protect himself from 783 counts of corruption, fraud, racketeering and money laundering levelled against him when he came to power in 2008, President Zuma systematically dismembered and manipulated the once highly functional South African Revenue Service and the National Prosecuting Authority. Zuma's key man in this process was his longtime comrade Tom Moyani, whom he appointed as the head of SARS as Commissioner in 2014, and who from day one loyally set about obliterating all of its investigative capacity with the assistance of his deputy, Jonas Makwakwa. These two turned the institution, which under the leadership of the highly respected Pravin Gordon had consistently over-delivered on revenue collection, into one now facing a 51 billion rant, that's three billion pounds revenue shortfall. But Makwakwa's unethical behaviour was quickly exposed in May 2016 when South Africa's financial crime regulator, the Financial Intelligence Centre, ordered SARS to establish whether several suspicious and unusual cash deposits and payments into these accounts of Makwakwa and his lover, a low-level SARS employee, Kellyanne Elsky, were the proceeds of crime and or money laundering. About 1.7 million rond about £100,000, a lot in South African purchasing power terms, have been paid into their bank accounts over a six-year period. The FIC noted that the amounts flowing out of Makwakwa's account were, are of concern as they originate from unknown known sources and undetermined legal purpose. But when the FIC reported these suspicious transactions to Moyani, he tried to ignore the request by keeping it a secret. At the same time, the FIC reported the suspicious transactions to the police known as the Hawks to investigate the alleged criminality associated with the transactional flows, and they opened a case. Four months later, in September 2016, news of the FIC's report to Moyani was exposed by investigative journalists, and he begrudgingly suspended Makwakwa and later Elsky. This is when Hogan Lovells entered the picture. Moyani appointed the law firm to conduct an independent investigation into the Financial Intelligence Centre's allegations to ensure transparency, independence and integrity, and then to recommend and independently facilitate necessary action, including disciplinary action. Hogan Lovells was therefore appointed to investigate the allegations contained in the FIC report and to conduct disciplinary proceedings uh, against Makwakwa on behalf of SARS. To that effect, Hogan Lovells drafted the terms of reference for the engagement, a seven-page roadmap map signed and adopted by SARS. But Hogan Lovells failed to investigate the very reason the firm was appointed for, the allegations contained in the FIC report. Hogan Lovells deviated so materially from its own terms of reference, allowing itself to be blindly led by Moyani, who redefined the terms of reference as and when it suited him, to an outcome which a respected investigative journalist 
described as being, and I quote, so tailored that it borders on the realm of being cooked. What an indictment of a leading international firm, that is to say, Hogan Lovells and its role. The allegations against Makwakwa involved layers of possible transgressions, these being one, tax laws breaches linked to whether he declared the transactions, two, criminal breaches linked to whether the suspicious transactions were predicated on corruption or money laundering, and three, whether internal SARS policy breaches had occurred. Moyani also mandated PricewaterhouseCoopers to analyse Makwakwa's tax compliance with regards to the suspicious and unusual money flows through his accounts. The Hawks were simultaneously investigating the criminality. Hogan Lovell's mandate was, according to their terms of reference, to institute an independent investigation, partly using the findings of these other processes to assess the veracity of the FIC allegations against labour and administrative law and institute a disciplinary process. But then two things happened. First, SARS declined to provide Hogan Lovells with PricewaterhouseCoopers' investigative report into Makwakwa, citing taxpayer confidentially, an inaccurate interpretation of the law, which Hogan Lovells accepted without question. And second, Hogan Lovells never made contact with the Hawks to assess the status of their investigation, information which would logically be crucial to their assessment of Makwakwa's fitness as a senior SARS employee. Equally puzzling is that around that time, South Africa's parliament got interested in Moyani's puppet mastery of Hogan Lovells, prompting a parliamentary question about the nature of the engagement between the two organisations. In Moyani's reply, which is a matter of public record, my lords, he said that Hogan Lovells had been mandated to investigate contraventions of tax laws and money laundering allegations, and that they would assist the criminal authorities when necessary in investigating these transgressions. They would also deal with the SARS disciplinary process, and in a press statement released weeks later, Hogan Lovells toned down this interpretation, say, saying that the scope of the investigation conducted by the firm was, quote, limited to identifying whether any misconduct had been committed by Makwakwa and Elski as employees of SARS. It did not seek to directly investigate the financial transactions identified by the FIC. My Lords, if you're confused, it's because you should be. This obfuscation was precisely what Moyani set out to achieve, and to which purpose Hogan Lovells was either a willingly gullible or malevolent accomplice. The end result is that the firm issued an incomplete, fatally flawed whitewash of a report, which ultimately cleared Makwakwa, despite reams of evidence to the contrary. Most damning of all, Hogan Lovells failed to include crucial evidence from the PwC report and the status of the Hawke's investigation in their own report. That meant that Makwakwa has only answered to a fraction of the allegations levelled against him a serious deviation from Hogan Lovell's mandate. It is beneath contempt, my lords, that Hogan Lovell subsequently tried to justify its work by hiding behind various complex legal provisions, sections and subsections explanations which have been described by legal experts as utter nonsense. Hogan Lovell's cover-up led directly to the corrupt Moyani exonerating his corrupt de deputy Makwakwa and welcoming back on the 30th of October 2017 to continue their looting and dirty work of robbing South African taxpayers. My Lords, bringing my remarks to a close, Hogan Lovell's must stand indicted by the Solicitor's Regulatory Authority which should seek and publish answers to the following questions. First, why did Hogan Lovells accept these ma this mandate whilst knowing about Tom Moyani's corrupt Zuma Gupta agenda? Why did, did Hogan Lovells allow itself to be controlled by Moyani, including allowing him glibly to alter the terms of reference to suit his agenda at various points in the sorry saga? Why has Hogan Lovells failed to release their documents, including the original terms of reference their final report and any other relevant documentation which would help clear their name to the South African Parliament. What have they got to hide? How much money did Hogan Lovells get from SARS for this investigation? Will Hogan Lovells pay back that fee? If not to SARS, then at least to the South African charities combating the poverty they have helped deepen. What is the relationship between the South African chair Hogan Lovells, Lavery Modisi, 
and the Commissioner of SARS, Tom Moyani. Why has Hogan Lovells allowed itself to be used to undermine the South Africa's Revenue Collection Agency? Some of the suspicious transactions received by Mark Wapwa were in US dollars. What onus does this place on the regulatory authorities in the US, and indeed Hogan Lovells is also a US-based firm, to report and investigate? My Lords, Hogan Lovells have ducked and dived over their responsibility and complicity in propping up state capture, corruption, cronyism and money laundering in South Africa. I trust the SRA will sanction them and that the British Government Ministers will also issue an edict that no British-based firms should do any business whatsoever with any member of President Zuma's family or with any member of the Gupta brothers' family and that any work for any state agency or state-owned enterprise in South Africa must only be undertaken with total integrity not connivance in criminality like Hogan Lovells have been guilty of. My Lords, I thank you for your indulgence. Uh, my Lords, in relation 